I want to uh, keep showing you guys uh, some antiderivative, some integrals that involve antiderivatives. And um, again, they are not just rectangles and simple triangles. They are problems that are worthy of this f of b minus f of a strategy. This is an interesting problem. How about the integral of the sine of x from 0 to pi? Hmm, why is this an interesting problem? Okay, there's, you've been exposed to this problem. It happened when we were not in the classroom, but you were act, you, you've messed around with the sine of x as a little hint. Let's talk about it together. Okay. So I definitely want you to get the antiderivative correct. Be careful. Don't just quickly shout out that the antiderivative of sine is cosine. It's not cosine. But you do want to be thinking about what function has a derivative of sine. Okay, now, you stood up at my desk one day and you said that the derivative of blank is... So you have to kind of reverse that. Okay, again, it's not cosine, but it's negative cosine, the opposite of cosine. Okay. That's because the derivative of negative cosine is going to undo the negative and turn back into sine. Okay, now maybe you're putting this in a calculator. I've said a couple times that's okay. This does go back to some basic trigonometry, um, basically the unit circle. And uh, since this one's a little bit easier, it never hurts to mention that to do pi, to quote do pi, is to rotate to pi and think about the point. That point will always be negative one zero. Now to think about that point and then grab the cosine of that point. The cosine of that point is going to be the number negative 1, because that's the x value. But since I already have a negative sign, I technically end up with the opposite of negative 1, which is 1. I know maybe it's a little faster to put it in your calculator, but that's why it comes out to be 1. If you do 0, when I say to do 0, that means to plug in 0 for x, which is technically rotating 0 rotating zero, which takes me to this point. This point will always be one zero, lots of ones and zeros, but the cosine is the x value. That's why it comes out to be, now, because of this opposite sign right here, it comes out to be the opposite, the opposite of one. Be careful. Um, I've seen problems like this where it's kind of like you get these like numbers that look the same or technically that are opposites. And you do want to very, very carefully subtract them. Okay, so we don't want to haphazardly say that the answer is zero. We do want to be aware that when you subtract f of b minus f of a, that you actually end up with an addition problem. And uh, a number that might look familiar. Okay. Remember, we, we actually did it together. Um, you guys looked thrilled that morning. Um, you would have thought that I was killing you there. But uh, we talked about, as an exit ticket, the sine of x from 0 to pi. And that's this bump, this space. And today is the day that you kind of proved it. Today's the day that you proved it. Interesting how it just comes out to be the number 2. It's also interesting how simple that proof is. It just requires the antiderivative. Having fun? Okay, this is a neat, neat lesson because it allows you to do a little more than, again, just kind of the basics. What do you think about this one? You can think about it on your own. Maybe. Maybe we will talk about it, but uh, the integral of 4 over x plus 2 from 1 to 5.
let me give you a thought here. Not the whole answer, because I want you to be able to do something. We had a rule. It was up on the screen Friday. Um, it kind of looked like you were just sort of pulling out a number. It was rule number three. It was called like the constant multiple rule. I just want to show you that you're allowed to pull out. It's actually a coefficient. I don't know why the book calls it a constant, but if I took the number four out, now I'll share that it's not really necessary for me to do that. Maybe the Maybe once we figure out the answer, you'll say, yeah, I didn't, I don't need to do that, right? But if I take out the number four, then I'm staring at one over x plus two. As a calculus student, one over x plus two is supposed to ring some bells. You realize that we're, we're pausing and wondering, do you know the antiderivative of one over? That's a hint, the antiderivative of one over. When it's one over x plus two, it's always going to use well, it starts with an L and it ends with an N. It starts with an L but ends with an N. It's always going to be LN. Okay? Now the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 2 is the LN of x plus 2. What's up with this 4? Well, a lot of times people will include it with this antiderivative, which is why I said that you don't really need to like pull it out. But you could have left the number four out there and just worked with the ln of x plus two. I'm going to choose to put the four right there so we don't forget about it. Just give you a moment to think here. So it's always f of b and then f of a. You want to think that way. It's not, I don't want you to think like that that's backwards. I want you to think f of 5, then f of 1. Now, when you plug in 5, you get the ln of 7. When you plug in 1, you get the ln of 3. I'm presenting it like that because we're at a little bit of a, a crossroads. If this is a no calculator uh, part of a quiz or test, then you have no choice but to leave your answer uh, in terms of ln. So I can subtract the ln of 7 and uh, the 4 of the ln of 7 and 4 of the ln of 3. Okay, you obviously could also put that in your calculator as a decimal. I want to keep it though in this ln form because I want to show you something. Okay. As we talked, you could have taken out the number four. It, it's sort of because I put it back in, now I'm taking it back out. So it's fine. But the reason I'm taking it back out is because there's something from your study of logarithms. Now, this gets into some gray area for kids. Um, sometimes students are like, yeah, I don't remember that, Mr. Naylor. But um, there's a rule, there's a property there's a way that you can simplify the ln of 7 minus the ln of 3. And it's not 7 minus 3. It's not ln of 4. It's that funky thing where if you're subtracting logs, that's the same as dividing. Okay, we'd have to go back to the theory of logs. But I'm telling you that when you look in the solution manual, and I would like you to be able to do this and know why you're doing it, if you're subtracting, that's the same as dividing. Now, notice what I did here. It's one log that now is of 7 divided by 3. It's not the log of 7 divided by the log of 3. It's not two logs. It's just one log of 7 minus 3. It's called condensing. It's called condensing from studies on logarithms. Okay, I could still turn it into a decimal. But I'm clearly trying to say that you don't need to do that. I actually want you to be more comfortable with that type of answer. What do you guys think? Anything that's happened? Are you sure? I think I have just one more problem here. But... Um, 
Let's see what this one has to say to us. Let me step back and encourage you guys to mess around with this. It sort of looks, actually kind of looks simple. I'll just say though, be careful. All right, now I see just about all of you finding the antiderivative and finding it correctly. That's good. But um, it's very important. I don't know if you've, you're like, yeah, I got it. But you got to change the function. You can't just like use 4x. In order to use this rule, you have to change the function back to capital F of x. Add to the exponent and divide by 2. Add to the exponent and divide by 2. Again, overall it looks like nice job. There's not necessarily something tricky about this problem, but have you noticed anything? Are you sort of like aware? F of B. F of B would be F of 2. F of A, F of A would be F of 6. Did you notice? Okay, I never said that it's always big number minus small number. I just said it's always B minus A. Okay, there's definitely something that seems to be switched right here. It's kind of switched. If you plug into... Please uh, be careful. You know, sometimes the arithmetic is the only thing that we get wrong, but it's squared, two squared, then double it. It's six squared, which is 36, then double it. Okay, so we end up with eight and 72. Okay, again, be careful. It's F of B minus F of A. So as, as many of you have done, which is great, it's eight minus 72. I don't know if you kind of like questioned it, but the way this problem is set up, we need to end up with negative 64. Is that right? Negative 64? Okay, so why am I pausing on this? Why is this something to discuss? Well, there was a property, and I'll be honest, when I gave it to you the other day, I kind of said, it just is. But it just is because of of where is the property it's the first property okay the first property says the integral from a to b is going to be the opposite of the integral from b to a in other words if i change the order if i change the order i end up changing the subtraction and obviously if i change the subtraction then I'm going to end up with the opposite. So the answer is supposed to be negative, okay? But it's because the order has been switched. If you do this problem sort of the old-fashioned way, 
you'd have to be really careful because the old-fashioned way would be to think about a graph of 4x and then to think about um, the uh, space under this graph. But really, if we do the space under this graph as a trapezoid or maybe as a you know, rectangle and a triangle, if I do that, I might end up with the answer of 64 unless I understand that because it's backwards, it's still going to come out to be negative 64. No, that's not under, that's not under the x-axis. It's just property number one. Again, I switch the order of A to B, okay? But it's because of subtraction. It's, it's because you change the order of the subtraction. Okay, now tomorrow, um, and I'm going to just wait tomorrow, but like I said, we'll have a couple specialty uh, problems. You'll see. One of them is an application, one of them is an, a special area, and then we'll try to get you uh, to, to do like an exit problem as we often do at the end.